This week on The Change Log, Cory Doctorow is back to tell us about how we can get back to that new good internet. By the way, this episode does include some explicit language. Be warned. I'll pause here for two seconds to give you a chance to hit that pause button. That's one. That's two. Well, Corey has a new book out called The Internet Con, which offers a lens to this conversation about de shittifying the internet through antitrust laws and regulation, limits on corporate tweaking, and all the other ways in shittification is enabled. Corey also shares his experience recording his own audiobook under the direction of Gabrielle DeQueer at Skybook Media, the ongoing DRM struggles of Audible, and what's to come from his new science fiction book, The Lost Cause. A massive thanks to our friends and our partners at Fastly and Fly. This podcast got to you fast because super fast is Fastly. Check them out at Fastly.com. And our friends at Fly will help you put your app in your database close to your users all over the world with no ops. Check them out at Fly.io. What's up, friends? I'm here with one of our good friends, Faraz DJ. Faraz is the founder and CEO of Socket. You can find them at socket.dev. Secure your supply chain, ship with confidence. But Faraz, I have a question for you. What's the problem? What security concerns do developers face when consuming open source dependencies? What does Socket do to solve these problems? So the problem that Socket solves is when a developer is choosing a package, there's so much potential um, information they could look at, right? I mean, at the end of the day, they're trying to get a job done, right? There's a feature they want to implement. They want to solve a problem. So they go and find a package that looks like it might be a, a promising solution. Maybe they check to see that it has an open source license, that it has good docs. Maybe they check the number of downloads or GitHub stars. But most developers don't really go beyond that. And if you think about what it means to use a good package to find it, to to use a good open source dependency. We care about a lot of other things too, right? We care about um, who is the maintainer? Is this thing well maintained? From a security perspective, we care about, does this thing have known vulnerabilities? Does it do weird things? Maybe it takes your environment variables and it sends them off to the network, uh, you know, meaning it's gonna take your your API keys, your tokens, like that would be bad. Uh, The unfortunate thing is that today, most developers who are choosing packages and, and going about their day, they're not looking for that type of stuff. It's not really reasonable to expect a developer to go and open up every single one of their dependencies and read every line of code. Not to mention that the average NPM package has 79 additional dependencies that it brings in. So you're talking about just, you know, thousands and thousands of lines of code. And so we do that work for the developer. So we go out and we we fully analyze every piece of their dependencies, you know, every one of those lines of code. And we look for strange things. We look for those risks that they're not going to have time to look for. So we'll find, you know, we'll, we detect all kinds of attacks and, and kinds of uh, malware and Uh, vulnerabilities in those dependencies and we bring them to the developer and help them when they're at that moment of choosing a package. Okay, that's good. So what's the install process? What's the getting started? Socket's super easy to get started with. So uh, we're, you know, our whole team is made up of developers and uh, so it's super developer friendly. We got tired of using security tools that send a ton of alerts and were hard to configure and, and, and just kind of noisy. And so we built Socket to fix all those problems. So we have all the typical integrations you'd expect, a CLI, a GitHub app, an API, all that good stuff. But most of our users use Socket through the GitHub app and it's a really fast install. A couple clicks, you get it going and it monitors all your pull requests and And you can get an accurate and kind of in-depth analysis of all your dependencies. Really high signal to noise. You know, it doesn't just cover vulnerabilities. It's actually about the full picture of dependency risk and quality, right? So we, we, we help you make better decisions about dependencies that you're using directly in the pull request workflow, directly, directly where you're spending your time as a developer. You know, whether you're managing a small project or a large application with thousands of dependencies, Socket has you covered and it's pretty simple to use. It's, it's really not a complicated tool. Very cool. The next step is to go to socket.dev, install the GitHub app or book a demo. Either works for us. Again, socket.dev. That's S-O-C-K-E-T dot dev.
for your latest book, The Internet Con, How to Seize the Means of Computation. Your latest for now, depending on when this goes out, it may not be the latest because you're publishing in a, in a frenzy right now, but this one has an audiobook component that you have a Kickstarter for because Amazon wouldn't take it. You want to help us understand exactly what happened there? Yeah. Well, that Kickstarter is actually done and it went really well. So Amazon has this policy that if you want to put your audiobooks on Audible, you have to submit to having your books wrapped in Audible's DRM. This is like unique to, of all of its digital offerings to Audible. So you can do a Kindle book without DRM, but you cannot do an Audible book without uh, DRM. And Audible is an even more powerful monopolist than Kindle in terms of the space. So more than 90% of audiobooks are Audible books. Yeah, I'd imagine. And so there are, is a mesh of laws, which I dig into in eye-watering detail in this book, all around the world, starting with Section 1201 of the American Digital Millennium Copyright Act of 1998, but also the European Copyright Directive of 2001, and lots of other laws all around the world. Canada's got one, Australia's got one, Central America and the Andean nations of South America have them, Mexico got one in 2020. And these laws make it a crime to show someone how to bypass DRM, even if, or do anything that would weaken DRM, like publishing volns against it, or, you know, reporting like a CV about a DRM system. And the crime for doing that, for weakening DRM, whether or not any infringement takes place, is uh, the punishment is a five-year prison sentence and a $500,000 fine for a first offense. And so what this means is that if you buy one of my books from Audible and I give you a tool so that you can take this book mm -hmm. that I wrote, that I paid for the studio to record, that I recorded with my voice, and that I paid to master... I commit a significantly worse criminal offense than you would if you just stole the book. Wow. Like literally if you went into a store and shoplifted it, you would, you would get a much lower penalty. If you, like probably if you knocked over a truck full of CDs of this book, you would pay a lower penalty. So this is what Jay Freeman calls felony contempt of business model. It's, it's a way for Amazon to use its market dominance to make it a literal felony to do things that Amazon wishes you wouldn't. So that every dollar you spend on an Audible audiobook is a dollar you will have to surrender if you leave Audible, break up with them, and delete their apps. And the more power Audible has over you as my customer, the more power, power they have over me as a supplier. Because if they know my customers won't follow them to another retailer, then they can turn the screws on me. And indeed, there are some pretty drastic screws they've turned. So... Audible has this platform called ACX, which is the Audible Content Exchange. It's like a self-serve platform, like, like Kindle uh, Direct Publishing or, or you know, even like um, going to Zazzle or something where you just upload some material and they, they put it in their storefront. And ACX is used by independent and small publishers to do audiobooks. And audiobooks are expensive to produce, like beyond the time that it takes to write them. There's, making a good audiobook is, is quite expensive, especially if you're paying voice talent. So these independent authors, they're sinking a ton of money into ACX. And Audible changed the way they did their accounting so that they could hide what has now been determined to be about $100 million worth of accounting fraud where they stole from those authors. And the authors, even after it was disclosed, first of all, they couldn't sue because they'd all agreed to binding arbitration as a condition of using the platform that was in the fine print. So they have to arbitrate those cases one at a time. But even so, they're all stuck around. Because what are you going to do, right? Yeah, what are you going to do? Yeah, it's like Lily Tomlin used to be on uh, Laugh-In. She'd play a, a Bell phone operator, an AT&T phone operator doing commercials for the Bell system. And they would always end with, we don't care. We don't have to. We're the phone company. <laughs> there you have it. Right? Amazon is the phone company. They don't have to care. And, and they will keep your business even if they steal from you. And so I won't allow work my work to be so with DRM. And so even though my books are New York Times bestsellers published by Macmillan and Company, one of the big five publishers, none of my books are available on Audible. Audible refuses to carry my books on a DRM-free basis. And the problem is that because Audible is 90% of the market, no one searches anywhere else for an audiobook. So if you go to Audible and you don't find my books, you're like, weird, I guess Corey doesn't have any audiobooks. And my audiobooks, to be clear, they're for sale everywhere else. I really like a store called Libro.fm that sells DRM-free audiobooks. Libro uh, is an organized public benefit company, and they do a rev share with a local bookseller the way bookshop.org does. So you, you tell them who your local bookseller is, 
And uh, they're like, oh, well, you probably found this book by going into the store and browsing it. So we're going to split the, sh- the profits with this bookseller. So there's tons of That's cool. other great platforms. Yeah, Libro and even Google Play will sell without DRM. But, but Audible won't. And so you can't get my books on Audible. You can't get them on Apple uh, Audiobooks, which until recently was just a front end for, for Audible. Now it's, a, now it's a competing product. But they, they kept that DRM rule. It's another thing that you lose if you give up your iPhone. It's not just the blue check mark in iChat. It's uh, or iMessage rather. It's it's all of your audiobooks uh, at mm. you know twenty five thirty bucks a pop. And so um, I have to find a way to sell these books because I want audiobooks. I love audio. I'm a podcast and audio person. I've listened to audiobooks since I was a kid. Like ever since you know those Disneyland little long playing records, you know you will know it is time to turn the page when Tinkerbell rings her little bell like this. Yes, <laughs> totally. Yeah, you know the Star Wars one that where it was like when R two D two beeps like this. So I've always loved audio, and I knew that I I wouldn't be happy with just not having audio. So my publishers they're they're good. They let me retain my audio rights because they're not going to force me to sell with DRM, but they also can't make any money back selling without DRM on the minority platforms that aren't audible. So I hit on doing these Kickstarters. I did the first one during the early months of the pandemic lockdown. It was the highest grossing uh, audiobook Kickstarter of all time, $176,000. Since then, a fellow you may have heard of called Brandon Sanderson beat my record by just a little bit. He raised $6 million in his audiobook Kickstarter. So, but I'm going to catch up with Brandon. I someday <laughs> and I hear he uses steroids to write. No, I, 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 <laughs> uh, he's juicing. No, I don't know how he, he's, he's an amazing writer. That's how he does it. But I've done this now for all the audiobooks since. And, you know, I keep dialing in how it works because it's, there's a lot of logistical complexity. My co author on the second book I did this way, which was Choke Point Capitalism with Rebecca Giblin, she pushed me to pre sell hardcovers as well, which is both a blessing and a curse. Like I literally, that ended uh, a year and a half ago and I literally sent out another hardcover from someone who had only just remembered to fill in their Kickstarter survey yesterday. So Mm. it's like that. It's like the ongoing commitment that never dies. But on the other hand, selling a couple thousand hardcovers that are pre-ordered from a bookseller that I have a relationship with and that I get to support. So an independent bookseller that makes a couple thousand book sales that then also has a Nielsen BookSense scanner who runs those books over the scanner on the day the book comes out, which counts towards bestseller lists. That's all good. And it's worth the extra effort. And the, you know, when you're bringing in six figures for each of these, even though, you know, a lot of that goes to pay for the hardcover books or with the eBooks that I sell, I wholesale them from my publisher at, at a 30% discount, which is like the normal does. It's the same discount Amazon gets there. Amazon has this thing where it's actually why the federal trade commission is suing them. If you're a vendor and you give anyone else a deeper discount than you give Amazon, Amazon kicks you off the platform. So they can't sell me my eBooks at a better discount than they sell them to Amazon, which is fantastic. Right. <laughs> Great for Amazon. <laughs> and I can't sell them. I can't sell them for less than Amazon sells them either. So that's the it's mm-hmm. a it's a double edged sword there. It's called most favored nation. Wow. And so yeah, I'm I'm here fighting the monopoly and getting my books out. And as I mentioned before we went live, I, I write when I'm anxious. So I pumped out nine books during lockdown. And uh, this one, Internet Con, is the I think the third or the fourth. And then the next one that comes out is in a couple of weeks as we record this, The Lost Cause. And then the next one is in February. It's called The Bezel. Uh, And then there's a graphic novel, another novel, a short story collection, and a collection of essays. Wow. So much. Prolific is the word that comes to mind. Yeah, for sure. And different categories. I mean, this this one that's out now, very much in the wheelhouse of what we've been talking about with you recently, choke point capitalism, interoperability, et cetera. It's... uh, Shovel ready, as you call it. But this next one that's coming up in a couple of weeks, what do you call it? Lost Cause? The Lost Cause. Yeah, it's a sort of a cli fi, hope punk, solar punk science fiction novel. Science fi. Uh, okay. About, about uh, a world where we've actually like addressed the climate emergency. Not, not to say that it's over, but we're not pretending that it's not happening anymore. So, like embarking on 300 year projects to move all the coastal cities inland and, uh, you know, setting up uh, permanent housing for hundreds of millions of refugees and, you know, going all in on um, addressing the, the wave after wave of zoonotic plagues driven by habitat loss and so on. And it's quite hopeful, right? Because 
It's one thing to be in a bus that's barreling towards a cliff. That is scary. But it's an even scarier thing if the driver and all the people in the pa- in the first class seats are saying like, there's no cliff. Don't worry about it. We're definitely not going to turn the wheel. Right. Like when the bus rolls and like a bunch of people have got like broken arms and legs, that sucks. But at least you're not going over the cliff anymore. And and this is about people, the conflict between the people who are like figuring it out and the people who want to get back in the bus and start driving back toward the cliff. So you've got like a a narco capitalist billionaire Bitcoin wreckers who float around the sea LARPing a Neil Stevenson novel. And you've got their frontline white nationalist militias. And, you know, a changeover in American politics as happens, you get these swings. And it's about what happens during the counter-reformation of a just revolution. And it's got really good early notices. Kim Stanley Robinson and Bill McKibben, who started uh, 350.org, Rebecca Solnit, who, um, you know, wrote Hope in the Dark, as well as many other very important books, and and, uh, Naomi Klein, you know, No Logo, uh, The Shock Doctrine, and so on. They're all big fans of this book. And so... I'm really excited for it coming out. I'm also a little exhausted with the prep for it. And that's hilarious because the prep is the easy part. It's like, it's like the part before the baby is born and then you're a father. Uh. And then that's a lot more work (laughs) than being a partner to someone who is pregnant, which is itself a lot of work, which is even, which is of course less work than being pregnant just for avoidance of doubt. Yes. By a few hundred percent, I think. Uh, Are you going to read that one too? I have read it. Oh, you have read it. So yeah, that audiobook just closed as well. Uh, that audiobook Kickstarter just closed as well. So after I finished Internet Con, the director I recorded it with is this woman, Gabrielle DeQueer. She's she's this award-winning, amazing director who's directed thousands of audiobooks. She is the co-owner of a, of a studio called Skyboat Media with her husband, uh, Stefan Rudnicki, who's also won every award under the sun, like Hugos and Audis and Grammys and just all of it. So I finished reading Internet Con, which I knew I could do a good job reading because it's sort of anchored around these applause lines from speeches I've given hundreds of times. I know that material really well. And Gabrielle came into the studio afterwards and said, look, I have never said this to an author before, but I think you should read your novel. Um, we, we, we had been auditioning little demo loops from other narrators all week while I'd been recording the Internet Con because we were going back in the studio in a couple of months to record, to record uh, Lost Cause. And she was like, you just, you just nailed it. And I don't direct anyone anymore except for LeVar Burton and Will Wheaton. But I will come and direct you if you want to try this. So we went back in the studio for a week and we recorded this. It came out fantastic. It is now loaded up in everyone's CMS. It goes live on the 14th of November, uh, including on my own site at craphound.com. And you'll be able to buy it everywhere. Audiobooks are sold except for Audible and Apple. <laughs> and uh, it's good. That's cool. When you wrote about this, I guess, plausible future of actually admitting if we're on the bus that there is a cliff, did you treat this exercise as a simulation of what we should do? So it's kind of a blueprint in a way, or is it truly fiction where it's like not really plausible and it's sort of like wishy-washy and dreamy? You know, like I'm not trying to degrade your work by any means by saying that, but I mean, like to what degree is it accurate? So I'll tell you that the hypothetical that I lean into here that I think is technically interesting, which is the idea that the more IT we have, right? The, like the more computers and networks we have, the more just-in-time coordination we can do. And that means we can do things like, say we need to manufacture just an ungodly number of prefab construction elements to do things like relocate whole cities or house tens or hundreds of millions of refugees. That itself is an energy intensive process, right? And it's kind of an own goal to do that in a way that that produces more carbon than you're offsetting here. And so I imagine things like solar factories in the Mojave, which is not the, this book is all set in, in the suburb of Los Angeles. I live in in Burbank, which I decided to do before lockdown. I, I started writing the book before lockdown, but then I found myself like stuck in Burbank. So normally I'm on the road like four to six months a year. I found myself stuck in Burbank for a couple of years while writing this book. It was actually really good. I was able to like really nail the terroir as it were. So, you know, if you've got a factory out in the Mojave that's solar powered, people can work that factory when the sun is shining and when doing low clinker solar sintering is available to you. And then when it's not a great day to do it, they can find people to hang out and party with because we have this coordinative capacity with our networks that 
is not present in uh, the earlier world. Like when I was a kid, if you wanted to meet up with your friends on a Friday night and go to a movie downtown, you take the subway downtown and you would call their house from a payphone with a quarter and you'd either leave a message with their parents or on their answering machine saying like, can you tell Zach that Corey is downtown and if he wants to get a movie, he should leave a message with you and I'll call back or call my mom because she's at home and I'll call back and find out. We'll arrange a place to meet, right? That was how we used to coordinate. It was really hard. And now it's just like, you're in a group chat and you're like, who's up for doing something? And then a few seconds later, you all converge. So we have this incredible group forming and coordination capacity that we've never had before. And I, I ripple that out through the whole society. So, um, you know, there's, there's all this panic right now about the great reset and this idea that no one's going to own anything. And it's kind of this right wing talking point, but there's a version of that. That's really quite utopian, right? Cause like, I am for the for for my sins. I am now a 52 year old suburban homeowner, and that means that three or four times a year I got to put a hole in a wall. So I need to own a drill. So I have the minimum viable drill, right? Like the 18 dollar drill from the hardware store that whose like signal virtue is that it doesn't explode in white hot shrapnel every time I turn it on. And that drill is not an asset; it's a liability. You know, I have to store it. I have to use it. I have to risk my life with it all the time. But like economically, it doesn't make any sense for me to go and buy the kind of drill that like someone who makes a lot of holes has. So right. what if we just had a, a lot of stochastically circulating high, high quality drills that were location aware, measured their usage, gathered telemetry constantly for continuous improvement, were designed with the non-economic imperative of gracefully degrading back into the material stream when they reach the end of their duty cycle, you know, like all of the stuff that markets wouldn't do, but that planning could that would end up with a world in which you have significantly more material abundance, right? Like anytime you need a thing, whether that's, you know, we, we've got like a, a couple of big folding tables and a whole bunch of extra plates for the one to two times a year that we have a ton of people over in the backyard and we set up a table and we have like a dinner party. And again, like the square footage in this house is not free. The fact that I'm giving it over to this incredibly rare usage is not an asset. It is a liability. So what if all of this stuff was just in circulation all the time? It, it could be in your neighbor's house. It could be at the library. It could be somewhere else. And there's just this kind of constant circulating abundance. I call it library socialism. And so this is all like IT-driven, telecoms-driven, communications technology-driven, smart coordination. It's IoT without the terrible extractive business models and the planned obsolescence. It's like what a, what a people's IoT would look like. An IoT designed for sustainability and not for, you know, extraction and, and in shittification. And that, I think, is uh, it's quite an exciting way to think about the future. You know, like it's easy to look at all the stuff that we have that's so bad in our technological realm. Like everything has undergone such regression since, you know... 10, 15 years ago, like, like the quality of our goods, the reliability of them, the likelihood that they can be maintained and so on. There's just such incredible regression in product and, and service quality. And imagining that we didn't have to like have this like entropic force of extractive capitalism bearing down on every technology that we use and rely on so that like each new update isn't potentially a way to smuggle a downgrade into a security update like like hp keeps doing where it's like oh yeah this is a new important security patch for your printer uh the security that it patches is that your printer can currently use third-party ink and once it's patched your 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 printer won't use third-party ink that's about safeguarding <laughs> our security we don't distinguish those and by the way we might also ship you a patch that keeps your printer from being infected with malware and also call that a security patch. So if you don't want to install security patches, you just go ahead, but don't come crying to us when like, right. you know, you print, a, you print a rotten document and it rewrites the firmware in your printer, which then starts to like end map your LAN, uh, run zero days on your computers and open a reverse shell to a command and control server that runs your whole network, right? Which is an actual demo <laughs> that Ong Kui did at one point. Uh, I saw him wow. do that demo at um, CCC once. Uh, the presentation was called Print Me If You Dare. It turns out that um, for a lot of printers, the way that you uh, flash the firmware is you just embed uh, like a meta tag in the postscript that says new firmware starts here. 
And when the interpreter encounters that, it's just like, oh yeah, I'll just, I'll just, uh, <laughs> I'll just install it. So you can like send a, a job called like resume dot doc to a, a, a printer and uh, the hidden postscript in the file takes over the printer and uh, wow. rejects all future updates. So the only way to, to get rid of this printer is to send it to a landfill. Like there's no wow. way to ever rehabilitate it. It's, it's pretty gnarly. What's up, friends? I'm here with Vijay Raji, CEO and founder of StatSig, where they help thousands of companies from startups to Fortune 500s to ship faster and smarter with a unified platform for feature flags, experimentation, and analytics. So Vijay, what's the inception story of StatSig? Why did you build this? Yeah, so StatSig started about two and a half years ago. And before that, I was at Facebook for 10 years where I saw firsthand the set of tools that people or engineers inside Facebook had access to. And this breadth and depth of the tools that actually led to the formation of the canonical engineering culture that Facebook is famous for. And that also got me thinking about like, you know, how do you distill all of that and bring it out to everyone? If every company wants to like build that kind of an engineering culture of building and shipping things really fast, using data to make uh, data informed decisions, and then also informed to like, what do you need to go invest in next? And all of that was like fascinating, was really, really powerful. So, so much so that I decided to quit Facebook and start this company. Yeah. So in the last two and a half years, we've been building those tools that are helping engineers today to build and ship new features and then roll them out. And as they're rolling it out, also understand the impact of those features. Does it have bugs? Does it impact your customers in the way that you expected it? Or are there some side effects, unintended side effects? And knowing those things help you make your product better. It's somewhat common now to hear this train of thought where an engineer developer was at one of the big companies, Facebook, Google, Airbnb, you name it. And they get used to certain tooling on the inside. They get used to certain workflows, certain developer culture, certain ways of doing things, tooling, of course. And then they leave and they miss everything they had while at that company. And they go and they start their own company like you did. What are your thoughts on that? What are your thoughts on that kind of tech being on the inside of the big companies and those of us out here not in those companies without that tooling? In order to get the same level of sophistication of tools that companies like Facebook, Google, Airbnb, and Uber have, you need to invest quite a bit. You need to like take some of your best engineers and then go have them go build tools like this. And not every company has the luxury to go do that, right? Because it's a pretty large investment. And so the fact that the sophistication of those tools inside these companies have advanced so much and that's like left behind uh, most of the other companies um, and the tooling that they're, they get access to, is, is, is that's, that's exactly the opportunity that I was like, okay, well, we need to bring those sophistication um, outside so everybody can be you know, benefiting from these. Okay, the next step is to go to statsig.com slash changelaw. They're offering our fans free white glove onboarding, including migration support, in addition to 5 million free events per month. That's massive. Test drive statsig today at statsig.com slash changelaw. That's S-T-A-T-S-I-G.com slash changelaw. The link is in the show notes. Sounds like notifications too. I know you're not an iPhone user. At least I can assume that based upon, you know, the fact that you're on Linux right this second. You know, you're obviously rejecting to some degree mainstream operating systems. On the iPhone, I feel that way about notifications. Like notifications are not meant to be advertisements, but yet uh, Uber in particular will advertise to me. Southwest, I want to get yeah. my, I want to know my flights, right? I'm trying to get to my flight on time, but yet Southwest is like, hey, Get away this weekend. I'm like, no, that's not a notification. That's an advertisement. 
Yeah, that's a financial benefit right, to right. you. Even Apple does it now themselves. Yeah, I it's can't like, believe Apple yeah. lets it happen. Let it happen. They're doing it. Well, I'm just saying Apple like... Apple will send you advertisements as push notifications from Apple. I haven't had that personally, yeah. but I do see like in my settings to buy iCloud storage is like a, a bubble, right? Yeah. That red dot that says you've got something to check, uncheck it. And it's an ad. It's an ad to upgrade your services right. or a, do something ex- there you go. else. It's, that's an ad to me too. I yeah. cannot believe that. I like the thing where you open your dialer or maps or some other thing that you are using because like you have an immediate need to use it. And it's like, uh, we've added the ability to find French fries. Click here to learn more about French fries and G maps. It's like, Fuck all the way off until you reach the edge of the field where there's the, <laughs> the sign that off. says no fucking off beyond this point. <laughs> Climb that fence and continue fucking off until you reach the horizon and then fuck off some more. Right. I just want to know how like I'm trying to I'm like on the highway trying to reroute myself at 40, 50 miles an hour in a like right. w- because I just saw a sign saying there's a lane closed ahead. I don't want to know about French fries. Yeah, the Uber one is particularly heinous because you do want their notifications when you actually want their notifications. Oh, yeah. Like you can't just turn off notifications because there's times when you want to know, is it here or whatever. Right. But then they'll just use that exact same system, which they know you can't turn off to be like, hey, 10% off Uber Eats today. And you're like, well, what? We are segueing very smoothly here into the Internet Con, my, my last nonfiction book, which is a book about yeah. how platforms went sour and what to do about it. And my thesis is that basically there's three things that discipline companies that might do something bad to you. And, and I think all companies might do something bad to you, right? There's always like a product manager who's like, my bonus depends on figuring out how to extract a, a, a few more points out of this feature or whatever, or, or you know, hit some KPI and there are lots of ways that I can do that. And some of them come at uh, an expense to my users. And if I can, I might be tempted to do it, especially like if it's like, well, you either you do that or, you know, we're going to cut the headcount in your department. And that guy who's got a kid that's like, in a you know, was a preemie and is in the NICU is going to get fired and won't have health insurance. And they'll take his preemie baby out of the incubator. And like, you know, like it's very easy to talk yourself into doing bad things. So there's three things that stop companies from from hurting you. Right. One is the fear that you might go to a competitor. And one prerequisite for that is there have to be competitors. And the competition has to be meaningful. So we talked about how Audible doesn't really have meaningful competition. If you're like um, an app developer, there's no real meaning, meaningful competition between Apple and, uh, and Android. Right. Like what is the commission they charge you for in-app payments in Apple? 30%. What's the, yeah, what's the commission their dire competitor Android charges you? 30%, right? Like if Burger King and McDonald's charge the same price for a hamburger, are they really competing, right? So they're certainly not competing on price, right? So you need to have meaningful competition. And and these firms have um, gobbled up all of their competitors. So, you know, Google is a company that made a really kick-ass search engine a quarter of a century ago. And I don't want to undersell it. It was, it was magic, right? Compared to like Ask Jeeves and Yahoo and AltaVis, it was amazing. And then nothing else, right? Everything they try in-house, almost with that exception, crashes and burns. Well, they bought some cool stuff, right? They bought everyone else's ideas and operationalized them. Now, those mergers historically would have been prohibited, right? Up until like the Reagan era, you weren't allowed to buy your nascent competitors to create vertical monopolies you would have had to compete with them or source them as a supplier. So imagine if the entire ad stack or the mobile stack was not underneath Google, right? Because Google couldn't build an ad stack on its own. It had to buy it from someone else. So imagine if that was not underneath Google. And then you would have multiple competing vendors all using that ad stack. And because they were all competing with each other, you would have multiple competing ad stacks as well. So right now, Google, because it's stitched up the ad stack, because it, it's the demand side platform, the sell side platform, the marketplace, an advertiser and a publisher, right? They represent the seller, the buyer. They are the marketplace where they meet and they compete with both of them. This is like when you go for a divorce and your lawyer is also your partner's lawyer and they're also the judge and they're also trying to match with both of you on Tinder. And then when the whole transaction <laughs> right. is done, like who oh, gets gosh. the house? Oh, it turns out the lawyer got the house, right? So Google, Google and Facebook, which you know, again, are non-competing duopoly, uh, they take 51 cents out of every ad dollar. Like historically, it was like 10% was the the rake that intermediaries and ads uh, used to get. So that's money out of the pockets of publishers, right? So, so you have to have competition and we don't have that. 
companies buy their competitors. As Mark Zuckerberg once said, in a breathtaking act of uh, self-incrimination, it is better to buy than to compete. And then the next thing that happens when companies get this concentrated is you lose the second way that companies are disciplined, right? Which is regulation. So companies that break the law, if they're small, generally get punished pretty bad. We saw that when the GDPR passed in Europe, all the little European ad tech startups, they all went into business because they either couldn't comply with the rules or when they failed to comply with the rules, got slapped around by the commission and put out of business. Google and Facebook just ignored the rules. It's been 10 years now. They're still ignoring them. Now, maybe they'll eventually get brought up, but they can just like delay, move venue, move forums. You know, they keep insisting uh, all evidence to the contrary that they're Irish companies because Ireland is a crime haven where they don't really have a working data commissioner. You know, a guy like there is a guy who has that job, but most days he doesn't get out of bed. And when he does, he doesn't put on his pants. He just sits around in his underwear eating breakfast cereal and watching cartoons. So Google and Facebook get away with breaking the law forever, right, in Europe. And so they're not disciplined by regulation. So the historic contours of privacy, labor, fair trading, they're just not in there, right? Like if you walked into a store and you said, give me part number XYZ for my dryer filter, and they gave you a different part or they handed you five parts, none of which were that part. And then when you bought one of them and walked out of the store, they didn't mention that none of them were that part. That would be fraud. That's how Amazon works. Amazon makes $31 billion a year letting people pay to match your queries when they wouldn't be the best match otherwise. Right? That's, that's Amazon advertising. And so we throw away consumer protection and we throw away labor protection which is the other thing that would discipline companies. So you think about Uber. Uber does this thing called algorithmic wage discrimination where uh, Uber drivers, they sort themselves into these two buckets. They call themselves either ants or pickers. So an ant is indiscriminate. They take any job and a picker is very choosy. And if you're a picker, that is to say if the wage offer algorithm notices that you're highly selective, it offers you a higher wage per mile than you would get if you were an ant. But as your selectivity goes down, the algorithm starts pricing your labor lower and lower. If you back off from that algorithm, the uh, the wage starts to climb up again until you're back in. So it's like a fisherman playing a, a fish on a, on a hook, right? Le- reeling them out, reeling them in, reeling them out, reeling them in. In traditional labor markets, this is illegal. But when your boss is an app, it's not. And so this is the second realm, right? They're unconstrained by regulation. So they're not constrained by competition. They're not constrained by regulation. And then there's the third bucket of constraint, which is self-help. So historically, when like browsers were a cesspool of pop-up ads that would like, you know, 20 of which would spawn every time you open a new window and they would be like one pixel square and they would run away from your cursor and they'd auto play music or they'd go full screen or and show porn. I mean, you know, these just awful, awful pop-up ads. We didn't ban them. It's just that browser vendors started to ship uh, pop-up blockers that were on by default. Started with uh, Opera, then Mozilla, and then, you know, because it was a competitive market, everybody started doing it. And so that was the end of it, right? Why pay for a pop-up ad if the pop-up ads never show up? So if you've been thinking about that Uber wage discrimination deal, it might have reminded you of something. Like, maybe it reminds you of exponential back-off in TCPIP, or maybe it reminds you of how bids and puts are done by um, uh, liquidity provision uh, stock trading bots, where they notice that the price is going up, so they reduce the frequency with which they're bidding until the price comes back down. So there's no reason to imagine that you couldn't like make an app that was like a meta Uber app for drivers that noticed when the price was going down for labor and coordinated among multiple drivers to not have that happen, right? To reject jobs until the price goes back up. Or, you know, what you were just talking about, your your app is giving you notifications you don't want to see. There's no reason why you couldn't pop up block that. The reason that you can't do it is not technical. It's that Section 1201 of the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, the same law that bans you from removing DRM from an audible audiobook, also makes it a felony to reverse engineer those apps because they're encrypted. And so one in four web users has installed an ad blocker. It's the largest consumer boycott in human history. Zero app users have installed an ad blocker because the first step to installing that ad blocker is to reverse engineer the app, which can land you in jail for five years. And so... This is the third area of constraint that it, that firms are removed from. Their regulatory capture allows them to exercise unlimited discretion 
and how they reconfigure these infinitely flexible digital tools. And it allows them to confiscate the discretion that we would have to reconfigure those tools so they serve us instead of their shareholders. Even when nothing unlawful takes place, if bypassing DRM or violating terms of service or, you know, Apple, uh, the subcomponents on iPhones have tiny microscopic Apple logos engraved on them so that when they're refurbed uh, or harvested in the Far East and then sent back across the U.S. border to be used in refurbs, they argue that that's a trademark tarnishment and they have them stopped at the border so you can't get the parts so you can't fix the phone. So mm. like even even in markets where – like even the kinds of repairs you can do on an iPhone without bypassing DRM – and risking criminal prosecution, importing the parts to do it from old phones is potentially a trademark violation. So you have this incredible regulatory leeway in preventing business customers and end users from altering the business logic of the service to serve them. You also have the same leeway in undertaking those same alterations on your own behalf as the OEM. And no one competes with you. So even if you could beat those other two forces, there'd be nowhere to go. And the reason nobody competes with you is because of those two things. And so it's all sewn up. So how do we get everything back? Well, the first thing we got to do is just antitrust. And that's amazing. There's there's a lot going on right now with antitrust. You know, Google's in court. Amazon's in court. Apple's got a, a investigation pending in the EU. Salesforce, they say they're going to go after the Microsoft Activision merger again in the US. You know, just like you look, you name it, like this is a historically unprecedented time. It hasn't looked like this since I was like in diapers, right? Like you have to go back before the Carter administration to find this degree of antitrust. And not just here in the EU, in the UK, in Australia, in Canada, and even in China, where the Chinese cyberspace regulation actually bans companies from reconfiguring their services to block interoperability. So you have this like you have this incredible moment where people are recognizing that antitrust matters. And it's happening across lots of different markets and lots of different agencies. Like the Consumer Financial uh, Protection Bureau just uh, promulgated a, a proposed regulation that will force your bank to interoperably port your data out either to comparison shopping sites that will say like, oh yeah, you you know, this is your mortgage, this is your APR on your credit card, this is how often you get hit by, you know, overdraft charges, this is, you know, how much you've got in your savings and what interest rate you're getting. You should be at this other bank, right? And and then one click, port all your data to the other bank, including all your transaction history, your pays and everything. So that's coming out of the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, like not out of the consumer protection agencies, not out of the DOJ, not out of the Federal Communications Commission, right? It's like the bank regulator is, is getting in on the act. So this is great, right? So this is step one, antitrust. Step two, constrain the way that the firms twiddle the knobs on the back end, right? Make them respect and obey privacy, labor, and consumer protection laws. And the book gets into, as you said before, shovel-ready proposals for this, right? Ways that you can actually, like... um hold them to certain codes of conduct where breaches are easy to detect because a lot of the codes of conduct that people want to impose on tech are really hard to prove when there's a violation. Like if you say, oh, no one, you have to stop people from harassing people on your platform. It's like, all right, now we have to agree on what harassment is. Then we have to take some instance of a user doing something bad to some other user and agree on whether that was harassment. Then we have to depose your engineers and figure out whether you did enough to stop the harassment. And now it's like five years later and there's been 50,000 more, 50 million more harassment complaints. What's the point, right? It's just not going to work. Even if you really think harassment is a problem, as I do, right? This, this is just not a workable remedy. But the book goes into some other remedies like, um, you know, in Mastodon, there's a one-click facility to export an XML file or maybe it's a JSON file that has your um, all of the people you follow, all the people who follow you, as well as your blocks and uh, mutes and whatever. Uh, with one click, you can export that. And with one click, you can export it somewhere else. And everything just shifts over the same way. If you know the RSS spec at all, there's like a directive in RSS where you can say this feed is moved. And just like the next time the RSS reader hits it, it just redirects somewhere else. So like if you're using, you know, Feedly or whatever, uh, and they they start charging you money for something that used to be free, or they start spying on your users, or they, you know, I don't know, start pureeing spotted owls as a 
internal corporate initiative to find a youth serum or something, right? You can just like upload the, the redirect uh, directive and then all the people who subscribe to your RSS go wherever you've gone to, you know, some WordPress feed. Right. Switching costs drop very low. Zero. Yeah. Exactly. So we could just say like to all the platforms, you have to support this, right? Um, Facebook, Twitter, Reds, Blue Sky, you just you just have to support this and you have to have interoperable messaging between it and community and media between them. So that if someone gets pissed off with Twitter, if someone's being harassed on Twitter, right, we have to ask ourselves, like, if I get harassed on Twitter, why do I try and get the government to make people stop harassing me rather than leaving? And the answer is, it's expensive to leave Twitter. Your friends are there, your customers are there, your communities are there. And so what if we just made it easier for people to leave the places where they are mistreated, rather than trying to police the conduct in those places, uh, at least to the extent that that's our first line of defense, right? And the thing about this is it's really easy to administer. If I, if I call up the California Attorney General's office and say, Jared kicked me off his service and didn't give me the data I need to get set up on Adam's server, and, and you say, no, 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 I gave Corey his data, like the Attorney General can just say, like, Jared, rather than resolving this dispute as to who is lying, just give him the data again and CC me this time so I know what happened. And then we're done, right? There's no evidentiary burden there's no lengthy hearing there's no like it doesn't cost you anything to run this service it's like kind of built in uh so it's not a capital moat where it's like only giant companies can afford to comply with the rules so the future of tech has to be big it's just really straightforward so these kinds of shovel ready ideas are ways of seizing the moment in which crises erupt because like if there's one thing tech has given us it's uh, absolute abundance of crises and when these crises erupt in the absence of a good idea, we just do the same bad idea we did last time and hope for a different outcome, and it never works. So if we've got these ideas, like these shovel-ready ideas kind of floating around in the ether, the next time it happens, everyone can go like, do the thing. Do that thing we've all been talking about, right? Give people a right to exit. And the regulator can go, right to exit, what's that? And you can go, well, here's a bunch of hacker news threads about it, and here's like an academic presentation about it, and here's something from Usenix about it, and here's some proof of concept code on GitHub. And the regulator can go, oh, yeah, this is a thing that might work, right? Maybe we try that instead of the same thing we tried last time. And so that's how the book is constructed. It's constructed as an analysis of how we got here, and then an analysis or a set of proposals for what we can do that will make it really easy for you to leave the places where you aren't honored and treated well, which in turn will make those places, which are after all, always a mixed bag, right? I, I, I know nice people who work for every tech company. I know great people at TikTok. I know great people at Microsoft. I knew great people at Microsoft during the Steve Ballmer and Bill Gates eras, right? Like when those companies were just, it was just like the, the most, not just evil, but like incompetent and terrible company. I knew great people at those companies. There's great people at Apple, right? And that's the shame too. Yeah. You got these great people, these places that are trying to do good. Yeah. The companies that say they're trying to do good, but are obviously not doing the greatest they could be because of capitalistic needs and concerns or, right. well, you know, not unconstrained needs, right? right? It's not just capitalism because capitalism, usually when people talk about it, they think about competition as well. This is a little more like feudalism, right? Where where there's the idea here is not to build a service that other people use, but to build something that other people have to use to build their services, right? That's what a platform really is. It's like, I'm not providing the value, I'm capturing the value. And, you know, as a tech worker, I mean, if you're listening to this and, and thinking about where you sit in this in this world, like, think about how your world has shrunk. You know, when I entered the tech industry, the dream everyone had was, I'm going to work for this big, dumb tech company for three years, and I'm going to start my own tech company, and I'm going to bankrupt them. And then, like, like Compaq buying DEC, right? Or SGI buying Cray, right? And then it was like, okay, well, that's not going to happen. But I'm going to work for this big, dumb company for three years. I'm going to do a fake startup. We're going to make a proof-of-concept product. Then we're going to get Aqua hired by the same company again. It's a super inefficient way of getting a promotion and a bonus, but I'll get to call myself a founder, right? <laughs> there you go. And then, and then that dream shrunk again. And it was like, I guess I work for this company for life. They pay me really well. I get free massages on Wednesday. There's kombucha in the staff cafeteria. And now if you're a Googler, it's like, I'll work for this company until they lay off 12,000 of me and my colleagues 
within months of having done a stock buyback that would have paid all of our wages for the next 27 years. And the reason they can do that to the people that they used to court with such ardor because they thought that their future lay in talent markets is because they're the phone company and they don't have to care, right? The, the way that you get to make a dent in the universe again, the way that you get to dream big about doing stuff that matters is by having some controlled fire in these big, overgrown, fire-indebted old forests that we stopped allowing to burn down periodically. And when that good fire opens up some space in the canopy, when we let them fail, rather than propping them up over and over again with more and more regulatory capture, with more and more acquisition of the bona fide threats, then you personally, the tech worker who knows how to do stuff, you get to escape the inexorable proletarianization that you're living through now, where all you can hope for is to work until you're fired, and to enter back into that amazing dream that we once all had of really changing the world and doing things that make ourselves memorialized in the annals of tech forever. That sounds pretty good. You should read that in like a audio book. <laughs> yeah. You got a great, you got a great voice, here. great delivery. Let's yeah. go back to your, your first point, the sure. antitrust one. Cause that seems like the, like a necessary thing to happen. My impression is that what's going on right now. And I don't, watch closely so feel free to provide more uh, data points is that it seems like the u.s regulators are basically losing all these lawsuits though like the one that comes to mind right now is the activision microsoft one but it seems like the ftc hasn't been able to get anything done even though they're trying more than they've ever tried before does that is that that's my impression is that fair it's not quite true so they've done a they've they managed to make a whole lot stick through not through these high profile lawsuits but by promulgating rules so Tim Wu was the, the White House anti-tech czar until pretty recently. He's the guy who coined the term net neutrality. He's a really great guy. I've actually known him all my life. We went to elementary school together randomly. Wow. And lost touch for 20 years. And <laughs> That's crazy. Turned out we were working on the same stuff. So Tim is like a very good like technical person. He's a lawyer, right? A very good technical lawyer. He's also a, mm -hmm. like a techie. And he just like went and re looked really hard at the enabling statutory instruments of the uh, administrative agencies. And was like, there is so much that the agencies that the administration has the power to do that they just don't do, right? Like they just, they just like have these powers that they never use. And so they drafted an executive order that came out in July of 2020 that listed 72 different things that the administrative agencies could do to curb monopoly power in like really profound ways that would immediately return value to the American public. And they've been working their way down that checklist. They've hit every one of those. Lena Kahn, who's running the Federal Trade Commission, you know, the high profile cases she's taken on have really slowed the pace of acquisitions. There are lots of people who told me we were an acquisition target and the acquisition stopped when the big tech company, you know, Microsoft or Meta or whatever, Looked, took a look at the regulatory environment and said, we're not going to roll the dice on this one. So you're seeing a lot more competition in the market as a result of this. And then finally, like you're getting a lot, or not finally, there's two more things. One is that you're getting a lot more administrative action under the Federal Trade Commission Act that's more than just blocking mergers. So the, I, I mentioned that there are all these powers the agencies have that they haven't used in decades. One of those is the Section 5 powers of the Federal Trade Commission Act which haven't been used, like, again, really since the Carter administration, although they, they're not exactly obscure. You'll find them between Section 4 and Section 6. They're right there. And what they are is a empowerment by the agency to promulgate rules to block any unfair and deceptive business practice, period, right? So that doesn't mean they can just, like, wave a wand and say, this practice is unfair, cut it out. There is, like, an administrative procedure that they have to go through. So first they have to have, usually they do a market study, uh, sometimes they jump straight from the market study to uh, what's called a notice of inquiry where they say, like, we think this is a problem. What do you think? Right. And so then there's a round of comments from the public. There's a round of reply comments from the public. They absorb those comments and then they make a rule, uh, a proposed rule. And they have something called an NPRM, a notice of proposed rulemaking. So they make the NPRM. There's comments and there's reply comments. And then they make the rule. And provided that the rule is supported by the record, the NOI and the NPRM, the rule stands, provided it's within their their regulatory remit. So Section 5 is very broad. So Khan has used Section 5 to promulgate rules blocking non-compete agreements, 
she wants to do a, a national privacy regulation. So Congress, like we haven't gotten a broadly applicable uh, privacy law, one that's beyond just like kids or health or whatever, just a, like a general privacy law in this country since the VCR era. Like the last broadly applicable privacy law we got in this country was a law that bans VCR clerks from telling reporters what porn you rent. And it was passed because <laughs> congressmen were worried that their local video store oh, clerks no. were going to start disclosing their porn watching habits, right? That is the, like, we are in the year of our Lord, 20 and 23, right? Where we have like destruction rectangles in our pockets that spy on us from asshole to appetite. And we do not have a federal privacy law. It's been a quarter of a century and we still don't have one, right? So here's Khan, and she's like, spying on people this way is clearly unfair and it's often deceptive. I'm just going to make a federal privacy regulation, not a law, right? So that is that is like government officials doing good for you. It's pretty great. Um, now, on these lawsuits, when the antitrust changed in the Carter administration, then mostly in Reagan, Carter like pulled out one or two Jenga blocks and Reagan was just like pulling them out by the fistful. And when that happened, all the precedent went against the action those administrations were taking. And they had to create a new edifice of law in order to support these actions. They had to lose a lot in order to reverse and overturn all the precedents that had existed to that point. It's not like Brown v. Board of Ed or something, where like one day segregation is legal and the next day it's not, right? It was a bunch of wins here, wins there, big swings and little swings that built up this precedential edifice that eventually became the edifice that Khan is now chipping away at. It is brittle. It's ossified. It runs counter to the public interest. People are getting angrier about it. You know, it's not just tech antitrust that Khan is fighting, and it's not just tech antitrust we need to care about. Right. Pharma antitrust is pretty goddamn important. The fact that uh, Wall Street landlords are colluding to rig rents across the country, that's pretty important. Like, all of this stuff is really important. And they, Khan is now chipping away at this stuff from every point of fracture in the hopes of bringing the whole cliff face down. And when you start, you know, taking swings that no one has taken for two generations, for more than 40 years, right, you're going to whiffle a bunch, right? Like you're going to hit a lot of fouls. I hope those sports metaphors are good. I don't exactly know how many baskets you need to win a baseball game. But, uh, <laughs> you know, she's taking the swings. And one of the things that happens when you lose cases that are fundamentally just is that it can prompt legislative reform as well. So, you know, in the history of antitrust law, there, there are like four or five major antitrust laws, and most of them came about after attorneys general or enforcers took a case to court that they lost because the judges said, that's not what Congress intended. And Congress said, oh, yes, we did, and made a new law, right? So that that's also how you get new law, right? Losing isn't necessarily losing. Losing might be the step that you need on the way to winning. If the court says the law doesn't prohibit this plainly destructive conduct, then the legislature should say, great, we are going to take action for avoidance of doubt. And we're going to phrase this in words so small, even judges can understand them. Well, I don't know about your sports references, but I was waiting for a Wrath of Khan drop on that one. <laughs> I figured that would have been appropriate. <laughs> Sounds like she's working. Sounds like she's doing stuff. Yeah, yeah. So you're saying it takes time and there's a lot to tear down. I'd imagine a large backlog too with 40 years, right? Like if there's 40 years yeah. between change, there's probably a lot to dig through to even consider what to fight. And then the fight's still big once you consider fighting. And you know, one of the reasons that we historically took aim at monopoly formation, right? Which is, this is the, really the change that we had is we used to, until Carter and Reagan, we used to say, don't let monopolies form. And then afterwards, this thing called the consumer welfare doctrine said, well, maybe monopolies are good, right? Maybe like, what about the monopoly that it occurs because people just love what the company is selling? Right? Do you really want to punish people by taking away the thing they love best? You know, let's let's allow monopolies to form, and then afterwards, if they're bad, we'll stop them. Right? Well, the problem with that is that it's very hard to stop a monopoly once it exists. I, I told you about how Google and Facebook are able to ignore the GDPR. In 1970, the DOJ took action against IBM, which had been like 
just kneeling on the throat of the American tech industry for like a generation, right? Stopping anything from, from getting off the ground. And uh, for each year, for the next 12 years, until 1982, IBM spent more on outside lawyers to fight the DOJ than all of the lawyers in the Department of Justice Antitrust Division fighting every case in America accounted for. They outspent the U.S. government for 12 consecutive years. They called it antitrust's Vietnam, right? So once the monopoly exists, it's really hard to stop uh, or to check, right? It, it, this is why we prevent monopoly formation. And look, if you're like um, a small government, you know, kind of Ayn Rand reading libertarian, you should want anti-monopoly laws, because even if the only thing that you think a government should ever do is enforce a contract, the only way the government can enforce a contract is if it is larger and more powerful than the contracting parties, right? The referee has to have more power than the teams. And that means that the smallest government that you can have has to be bigger than the biggest company you're allowed to f form. And so the secret to a small government is smaller companies, Right, one way or the other, there's no good case for this oligarchic arrangement of of economics. Yeah, how do you measure size in that? Like, what do you mean by bigger than? Because I always look at the government as like, well, they have the military, and and uh, Microsoft doesn't have a military. I mean, I guess it's conceivable that the Air Force might strafe Redmond, but I I, <laughs> I don't think that's I I think that it's far more likely that these firms will be able to outmaneuver you know attorneys general right. So skilled participants in whatever the battlefield is. If it's yeah, law, then... The contestation. And, you know, you mentioned the military. In, in David Dian's book, Monopolize, he's got quite a parable about the military. So uh, under Obama, like, I, I can't stress exactly enough how um, bipartisan the favor for monopoly has been. So, uh, you know, R&D from Carter up to but not including Biden. And Biden's not my guy, right? I gave money to four... Democratic nominees in the in that primary, none of them were Biden. So, like, I'm not saying this because I love him. I, I I'm like I'm a I'm a Biden. I guess if I must, kind of guy here. <laughs> uh, but like under Obama, they the Secretary of Defense insisted that the primary defense contractors merge down to about five giant firms to make to streamline procurement. And a bunch of hedge fund guys looked at that and they said, okay, well, all these firms have subcontractors. Let's identify the subcontractors that are sole source suppliers for components that go into aerospace, military aerospace. Buy those and lower the price of those single source components so that primary contractors like Northrop or, or, or Boeing load up on them when they're building new platforms, new, new vehicles, because they're free, right? They're sold at a loss. And then as a replacement part to Uncle Sam, we're going to charge 10,000% markups. Right. So like, I don't know if the military can beat the tech sector. Right. That seems to be like the tech sector is beating the military like a drum. Pretty savvy. Yeah. You know, and one of the things that I talk about in this book when, I, when I'm getting into the theory of change and, and how, like, what is the actual path that we get to from here to there? One of the levers I think we can pull on is government procurement. Right. Because uh, the government is the biggest buyer of many technologies and even on technologies where they're not the biggest buyer, they're uh, such an economically significant buyer that without their business, a lot of firms would fail. And as just a matter of like sound public administration, governments could and should say, if you sell us something and then we try to buy like an add on or a plug in or maintenance or part from someone else, you aren't allowed to sue them. Right? Like you have to, you like, like the IPR that you have to sign when you go to um, the W3C, where you say, like, if you have a patent that overlaps with a standard you're making, you're not allowed to use that patent against people who implement the standard. We could just say, like, if you want to do business with the public, you can't constrain the public's ability to maintain and extend the functionality of the product you sold them. And this isn't even a new idea. So Abraham Lincoln only bought interoperable rifles and tooling and ammo from armorers that would agree to use standard sizes. Cause like it's embarrassing to be the commander in chief of the union army during a civil war and to show up at Gettysburg and say like, sorry, boys, war is canceled. Uh, the sole supplier for the bullets is an op opening this week. They're, you know, they had a big booze up and, uh, 
They're, they're all too hungover to make bullets. Go home. I'll call you when they're ready. So like, this is just good administration. And yeah, companies are going to go, well, how dare you constrain our ability to exercise our rights? And, you know, the correct public response is, oh, you don't have to. You just can't sell to us if you're going to. Because, like, yeah, your shareholders' priorities are important to you, but the public's priorities are important to us. And, like, if you're too emotionally fragile to be a supplier to the U.S. government, find a line of work that's, like, more suited to your delicate sensibilities. This is a changelog news break. Hugging Face released a distilled variant of Whisper for speech recognition. It's English only and optimized to the hilt, which resulted in running six times faster while being 49% smaller and performing within 1% word error rate from the original model. It's designed to be a drop in replacement, and the Hugging Face team cites five reasons why you might use it faster inference, robustness to noise robustness to hallucinations, designed for speculative decoding, and permissively MIT licensed. This looks great, but I'm still waiting on speaker diarization. You just heard one of our five top stories from Monday's Changelog News. Subscribe to the podcast to get all of the week's top stories and pop your email address in at changelog.com news to also receive our free companion email with even more developer news worth your attention. Once again, that's changelog.com slash news. Some of this seems... Not necessarily anti-capitalistic, but I'm, I'm curious of your thoughts on capitalism because it's like a chess move to acquire, you know, to think down the line far enough to be powerful enough in business and successful enough to create value, to create revenue, to have surplus, to acquire or even have the, the debt to income ratio to be able to do different things like that. So if you acquired, you know, somebody in the line and you said, well, as part of an acquisition strategy. I'm going to acquire X, Y, and Z that competes with me here so that I strangle a portion of the, of the free market. That's a move, right? That's a capitalistic move. And I can see the antitrust and these sort of, but isn't that just like the, the way business kind of works in a way? Doesn't that hold back the ability to have a free market and have, hold back the ability for a capitalistic natured world to thrive and operate? I'm just kind of curious what you think about how that plays out there. Yeah, sure. I guess it depends on what you mean by the free market. So the term free market really dates back to Adam Smith. And and Smith did not mean a market free from regulation. He meant a market free from something that economists call rents. And this is a this is a complex and subtle but really important idea. And really to kind of get your head around what the relationship rents have to capitalism, you have to read or, or it benefits you to read an essay that praises capitalism to the skies and especially its dynamism and imagination and its ability to grow and find new value. And that essay is chapter one of the Communist Manifesto, which is Marx and Engels just going like, holy shit, capitalism is amazing, right? So it's quite remarkable how many people who get their, their underwear in a twist about kids on college campuses reading Communist Manifesto, which is also the, term, the book from which we get the word capitalism you know, capitalists didn't come up with the word capitalism, communists did, <laughs> get really freaked out about it. Because like Marx and Engels are really excited about what capitalism can do. They just, they just want to change the, they want to see if they can preserve that dynamism. So Smith, when he's writing about free markets, he is contrasting two different economic systems, one of which is, is colloquially called uh, feudalism. More properly, like historians always write to me when I say this, so I'm going to say this now. Properly, it's not feudalism, it's manorialism, 
Manorialism is like feudalism, except if, if it's a feudal system, the king can order you to raise an army. So manorialists didn't have to raise an army. If you had like a land in which the peasants, you know, sowed barley, you didn't have to have a standing army ready to, to go at the king's command. That's manorialism. So under manorialism, which everybody calls feudalism, except for a few weirdos who send me email, <laughs> um, the major source of income was not profit, but rent. So the rent was a sum that was due every single quarter, irrespective of the performance of the asset that was rented from you. So think about like if you own a building with a coffee shop in it, the rent is the same, whether the coffee shop does well or poorly. You are owed that rent, right? And that rent is distinct from profit in lots of different ways. One of the important ones is that it's not subject to competition. So if the peasants on the next plot of land over and I should say here that under manorialism and feudalism, peasants were bound to the land. They, you weren't allowed to leave the land you were born on. You had to work it and pay rent to the Lord until you died. And then your kids had to do that and their kids had to do it. So you're a captive um, tenant. When we say tenant farming, that's what we mean, tenant farming. So these rents were not subject to competition. If the, if the tenant farmers on the next Lord's plot did better, you didn't do worse. Your peasants didn't go out of business if they did better, I guess you could hike the rent, but like you didn't like you didn't have to and and you didn't own the means of production, right? Like the landlord doesn't own the espresso machine in the coffee shop, and the landlord who owns the land doesn't own the, you know, the grain threshing apparatus, right? They just own the land. They own an asset that other people work with their capital. Sure. And in this case, the capital would be an espresso machine or a, a, a scythe, right? The capitalists hate the feudalists. Because the capitalists want to turn the um, serfs off the land. This is a process called proletarianization. So they want, to, they want to deprive them of the guaranteed income, but also liberate them from the forced labor and say, off you go, figure out a way to make a living. They want to rent that land and use it to grow sheep, which will be inputs to an industrial process, right? The textile mills. This is the industrial revolution. And then the fact that these workers have nowhere to go means that they'll come and work in the factories and spin the sheep's wool into textiles, right? So that's the, that's the process. Now, the more the rent is on the land where the factory is or the land where the sheep is grown, the more peasants are bound to the land and required to pay rent, the less money the capitalists get and the less dynamic the system is. Feudalism is static, right? The way that you grow your share of the income as a feudalist is you invade another country. That's why feudalists had to have standing army, right? You don't get it by like being a better lord than your neighbor, right? It's right. like the requirement for being a lord is emerging from a very lucky orifice, right? It's not like being good at business, right? And so capitalists, they are really subject to competition because the thing that creates this dynamism that Marx and Engels are geeking out about is that capitalists are fighting with each other to find ways to increase productivity, right? To generate more dollars per hour per worker. And the capitalists that do best put the other capitalists out of business and absorb their market share. And so there's this constant churn where capitalists, they just, they, they can't sleep, right? Like this is, this is, you know, Elon Musk's, you know, hardcore work environment, right? You're sleeping under your desk because if you miss 15 minutes in your commute the next day, that's 15 minutes that your competitor who sleeps under their desk is going to use to steal a march on you and put you out of business, right? So capitalists are always competing. Now, John Steinbeck supposedly once said, socialism never took hold in America because workers see themselves as temporarily embarrassed millionaires. And no one can show where Steinbeck allegedly said that, so he probably didn't. But also, it's probably not true. There's certainly like a pretty good labor history in America, which is also enjoying something of a renaissance right now. A lot of people who don't think of themselves as, as temporarily embarrassed millionaires. But it's totally 100% true that American capitalists see themselves as temporarily embarrassed feudal lords, right? That the goal of a successful capitalist firm is to cease being capitalist and become a rentier, someone who collects rent, right? To own AWS, not to use AWS. To own Amazon, not to be a seller on Amazon. To provide the Uber app, not to drive an Uber, right? These are rent extraction systems. 30 cents on every dollar for every app. It's because I own the app marketplace. I don't care. I don't have to. I'm the phone company, right? You have to pay me rent. And so 
we have lived through this period of about 40 years in which rents rather than capital, rather than profit, have been ascendant. And the difference between a feudal and a capitalist society is not whether there's only rents or only profits. There were profits under feudalism and there's rents under capitalism, obviously. There's landlords, right? The thing is what happens when rents and profits come into conflict, right? Like if, if your productive company gets hauled into a patent court in the East District of Texas by some patent troll who's like pulled the wool over the USPTO's eyes by saying like, I have a system and a method for like doing stuff with computers. And then they sued you for $300 million and you have to give them $300 million. That is the triumph of rent over profit. They make nothing but lawsuits. You make things that generate the $300 million that you give them in, 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 for the lawsuit. And so when rents are ascendant over profits, as they have been in a steady trajectory for 40 years, we tend to forget that rents aren't profits. And of course, all the Rentier companies are also profit-making, right? Google, like, makes phones. Apple makes phones. Amazon, you know, does a whole bunch of stuff that is stuff. They make movies. They make whatever, right? They have stuff. They have coders. They make things. But the majority of their income comes from rent. Like, Amazon Prime is actually free for Amazon to operate because the 51 cents they take out of every dollar for every dollar made on the platform by third-party sellers pays for 100% of Amazon's own shipping. So all the shippers that have to use Amazon, because they're the only, you know, if you don't sell on Amazon, you might as well not exist. All those shippers have fully subsidized Amazon's own use of its logistics system. Amazon uses that for free and also competes directly with those companies, which is nice work if you can get it, right? And so if you want to live in a capitalist society, right, like one in which innovation and excellence and productivity gains are the biggest predictor of your success rather than the orifice lottery, right, rather than just like claiming the land before anyone else gets to, rather than being the first person to build the cloud that then everyone gets locked into by their tooling and their other, you know, switching costs. And then you capture the regulators so that making interoperable tooling is impossible, right? If you want to be uh, unity where like you just rely on the fact that reverse engineering, reverse engineering unity and making a runtime that would allow people to recompile their games to run without your engine is a crime. And so you can now start extracting rent from people who made games with your engine. You can just like do Darth Vader MBA shit where it's like, yeah, I'm altering the, uh, the deal, pray I don't alter it further. Then that's feudalism, right? If you want to live in a capitalist system where unity doesn't get to swoop in and like bankrupt you overnight because they decided that you owed them rent on a thing you already bought and thought you owned, then you have to eliminate rents. You mentioned Amazon. Was Jeff Bezos born from a... Lucky orifice to just yeah, was he? Yeah, yeah. He's, uh, he started with four hundred thousand dollars and a um, MBA from his family, but he also he also just got lucky, right? I don't know about that. Can you can you really say that though? Can he, he just got lucky? Oh yeah, well he got lucky in the sense that um, like so for example he did um he floated a bond like a month before the dot com crash, and if it had taken him three weeks longer to float that bond, he would have gone under in the dot com crash. All the businesses that didn't float bonds just before the dot-com crash went bust. I suppose you can call that luck. Yeah, I mean, that, that part is probably well, a lucky draw. Timing. Sure, timing. But it's not timing in the sense that he was like, my spotty sense is tingling, right? It's just timing in the sense that he did it as quickly as he could and he got lucky. Aren't we all kind of in that same situation, though? Like, I mean, I was driving yesterday and almost got hit, right? Yeah, 100%, which is a great argument for mobility and competition rather than saying like, oh, that guy... He got lucky because like he was genetically predestined to rule, right? Sure. Like this is the this is the divine right of kings, right? Like so look, either Jeff Bezos, well, let's have a couple of different contrafactuals, right? I use that as an example because you were talking about prime and yeah. subsidization and the 51%. That's why I was bringing that up because Yeah. And the reason why I posed the capitalist question was because mainly because they are just so they're so profitable now and so capable now and so powerful now, but it began somewhere. And along the way, there was strategy and acquisition and, you know, conquering and whatnot. And well, I just, well, and cheating. I'm sure there's, right? 
Yes. Cheating, labor market cheating, attracting subsidies on false pretenses, you know, sucking up billions in pretenses and in, in subsidies and false pretenses, violating all kinds of laws in every way, you know, using uh, subcontractor gambits to avoid having to pay for like maiming and killing your workforce. Like there's, yeah, Amazon, you know, did a bunch of historically contingent things to get to where they were. But like, so let's look at a couple of different possibilities, right? So one is Jeff Bezos got lucky. Or, or Jeff Bezos, the way Jeff Bezos got lucky is he was born with a genetic mutation that made him Jeff Bezos, that made him the guy who was going to do this, right? So that's one. Another one is Jeff Bezos got lucky because he was born into a world with a Jeff Bezos fa- shaped hole in it and he filled it. And without Jeff Bezos, there would have been like, you know, a, another guy just behind him who would have done it. A third one is that Jeff Bezos is descended from a line of would-be kings, and he drew the sword from the stone. And Jeff Bezos' son and his son and his son can found a dynasty that from now on rule over us with the divine right of kings. So we've had all those different theories of history in the past. And the question is, which one do you think is like more plausible? Right? Like, I think that Jeff Bezos is good at some things. I also think that he got really lucky. Uh, Because there are lots of people who are good at the same things as him. I think that if there hadn't been Jeff Bezos, there would have been someone else who would have filled much of that niche. When you look at like what what it is he did there, the tactics aren't all that different from other people who did similar things. But, you know, he prevailed often by things that are that amount to coin tosses. And what I reject is the idea that like, you know, he's King Arthur. And yet the dynasties that the kind of wealth that that Jeff Bezos has established are self-perpetuating. Right. In the absence of some competitive force that allows for new market entrance, right? In the absence of like periodically burning down some of the forest to open up some space in the canopy so that new shoots can develop, he lasts forever, right? And his children and his children's children govern forever. You get this dynastic wealth. And not only do I think that's not true, that he is King Arthur, and not only do I think that even if he's good at his job, I don't want his kids and his kids' kids running the business. I also think that when you have a society built on those lines, it becomes extremely unstable because the legitimacy of a society, right? The reason we, we buy into its institutions and its norms and we accept its rules is because we think it's fair. And unless you're prepared to accept that you are a peasant whose destined was to be bound to the land, which, you know, the peasants didn't, right? They had uprisings. Unless you think that that's your, that is your destiny, then living in a world in which that is all that you can hope for is a world in which you will cheat any chance that you get, right? In which the system will fall apart. And so either we have a fair system or we have no system. I don't think we get an intermediate system or the intermediate system that we get is an authoritarian system that is intrinsically brittle and that collapses in the most awful way imaginable. I don't know all of Jeff's history and childhood and I remember one video where he was on the internet saying, or he was interviewed saying, uh, I was looking at the growth of the internet. I basically saw that it was growing at such a multiple. And I thought to myself, and I'm paraphrasing probably terribly, I want to capture what that growth is. And they began with the bookstore. And I'm not sure of all the exact history, but I did read uh, Working Backwards. Mostly, I've kind of jumped back and forth from chapter to chapter. And there's a certain respect you have to have for the way they've strategized the market. And I guess what I'm pushing back on is I see somebody who saw an opportunity and saw the opportunity to find the money, find the investors, push profits down the line so far in the tenacity and willingness to capture the market. And now they've captured the market. And sure, they've done some things along the way, which I don't fully know about, nor do I agree with if they're super negative, like, there's also lots of misinformation out there. I'm not saying that's not true or not. What I'm speaking to really is the, the capital market where isn't that the dream that we can all be, not that I would want to be, but the possibility of being a Jeff Bezos, right? That somehow I can see an opportunity in the world and put my work out there so hard, whether it's luck or good timing or whatever, however you want to shake it out, that that's a possibility. Well, I mean, I would say that um, the people who, work so hard in his packing facility that they can't even go to the toilet and just wear diapers and shit themselves are that pretty, sucks. but they're hardcore. No, 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 I'm not saying it's, that's terrible. I'm let's, let's stipulate it's terrible. Sure. They're hardcore. They're putting in the hours that Jeff Bezos is putting in. Right. 
So if, if the argument is, you know, work really hard, care about your job, give it your all and sacrifice, then I think we have to acknowledge that the existence of uh, Jeff Bezos means that for everyone else who's working just as hard, if not harder, there is no chance of being Jeff Bezos. That like le- that Jeff Bezos's success is antithetical to it. There's an amazing book I want to recommend to you. It's public domain. You can get the audiobook for free on LibriVox. And it's a book that was written by the first woman in America to get a science degree. Her name was Ida Tarbell. And her father was a Pennsylvania oilman who was ruined by John D. Rockefeller. And in her 20s, she became a self-taught investigative journalist. And she began to write an investigative history of John D. Rockefeller. It was serialized in one of the best-selling magazines of the day, a magazine called Collier's, and eventually collected in two volumes, The History of the Standard Oil Company, Volumes 1 and 2. It formed the basis of Congress's investigation into the Rockefeller empire and led to the breakup of Standard Oil. She was an amazing person. Wow. And in the last chapter of Volume 2 of the, of the History of Standard Oil, she in- introduces this concept she calls illegitimate greatness. And she says, John D. Rockefeller and the Oil Trust have done amazing things, right? Like he pioneered um, metrics and cross-enterprise knowledge sharing. So he would measure the performance of every oil refinery in his network. And the ones that perform best would become the sites of tours for the managers of the underperforming ones so that they would learn the techniques that the best performing refineries were using so that the whole empire increased. And she said, that is legitimate greatness, and we should celebrate John D. Rockefeller for it. But when a Rockefeller competitor tried to run a competing oil pipeline that would have allowed the Pennsylvania oilmen to get their oil to market without having to go through Rockefeller's refinery, he sent goons with railway ties to beat their brains in. And that is a form of illegitimate greatness. He was really good at it, right? Uh, But it is a form of illegitimate greatness. And when a senator from Ohio proposed a bill that would have constrained the action of the Standard Oil Company, that senator got a job working for a Standard Oil subsidiary in San Francisco that paid 20 times his senatorial standard and had no duties. And he moved to California. And that is a form of illegitimate greatness too. And we started off talking about how the pitch that tech people want to make to you is that their offerings are indivisible. That if you want Uber, you have to take the annoying notifications. But tech is decomposable. No one came down off a mount with two stone tablets and said, Jeff, run your warehouse in a way that causes your workers to shit themselves. Right? Like I, call me a crazy dreamer, but I can imagine a warehouse where people pack boxes and don't have to shit themselves. I can imagine right? that too. I'm with you. <laughs> I mean, I know. Like, let's dream here. I don't know what gets that to happen. They're like, what in the world happens inside of an organization that says we should optimize to this degree to essentially do enable that kind of system? Like, I don't get that. That doesn't make any sense. Now we're back to the forces that constrain firms. This is why Adam Smith said a free market is not one that's free of regulation. It's one that's free of rents. Because when a company doesn't have to worry about competitors, when it doesn't have to worry about regulators, and when it doesn't have to worry about its suppliers and customers helping themselves, then the worst people in the company win every critical argument. When you're sitting around a table and you're like, I built this Uber app. I missed my kid's birthday party for it. I worked through that kidney stone for it. And I care about this app. It's good. And the person sitting next to you says, we're going to send notifications about like tacos. And you say, fuck no, I didn't pass a kidney stone so you could send notifications about tacos through my awesome app. You will lose that argument unless you can also say, and we will lose a shit ton of money if you do it because we'll get fined because our competitors will move in or because our users will install a blocker and that will shut off some other important source of revenue to us, right? And so this is not about Like, I don't actually think Jeff Bezos is worse than many other people. I think that he's a normal person. Like, this is actually my, I think that if I, you and I have a disagreement with Jeff Jeff Bezos, is I think that he's fundamentally a normal person, both normal in terms of his evilness and normal in terms of his capacities that he just like got really lucky. But that the difference between he and others is not that he has less of a moral center. It's that his moral center wasn't disciplined in moments where it was easy to talk himself into doing things that some part of him thought was wrong. In the same way that like, if you've got a startup 
and you've convinced a hundred of your friends to quit their jobs and like put their kids' college funds on the line to come work at you, work for you. And your investor comes to you and says, I know we said we were on board with this open source shit, but fuck it. It's going proprietary. It's really easy to talk yourself into saying, I'm not going to turn these 150 people out on the street, right? Google just laid off 12,000 people. I can't do that, right? And to talk yourself into thinking that the right thing to do in that moment is close your source. But here's the thing. If you've GPL'd your code, that is an irrevocable license, So when your investor comes to you and says, it's time to close your source, you can say, Bob, you're right. You're you're 100% right. But here's the thing. We can't. Like, we just can't. It's irrevocably licensed under GPL3. And there's nothing we can do to take that back. And there's a name for that in economics. It's called the Ulysses Pact. And it's named after one of the most important hackers in history, Ulysses. And Ulysses was going to go sailing through the Sea of the Sirens, uh, where the, you know, the mermaids. Uh, and there was a standard protocol for surviving a mermaid encounter, which was to fill your ears with wax, because when you heard the song of the mermaids, you would jump into the sea and they would drown you. But being a hacker, Ulysses wanted to hear the mermaids. And so he said to his sailors, tie me to the mast, but leave my ears unplugged. And no matter how much I beg, do not let me go. Do not untie me from the mast. And so Ulysses heard the mermaids, not because he was stronger than the call of the mermaids, But because in the moment before he became weak, he used his strength to bind himself against an anticipatable moment of weakness. When you go on a diet, you throw away your Oreos, right? That is a Ulysses pact. When you irrevocably license your code, when you uh, organize a public benefit company, when you do any number of things that constrain your future actions so that when you're tempted, you can't yield to temptation, you prevent yourself from doing things that you'll be ashamed of on your deathbed. And without that, you and me and everyone we know are handily capable of reasoning ourselves into doing the worst things we can imagine and convincing ourselves that we're only doing the right thing. The internet con <laughs> on sale now. No, I just yeah. feel like we should just end right there. Like, why would you even add anything at the end of that? That was a mic drop. Let's, uh, let's send out the links. We've got the internet con on sale now. We have lost cause on sale probably now, depending on when you're listening. This one will be out before it's out, but if you're listening within, what, November 14th is the day? Is that what yeah, you said? Yeah, November 14th. And if you're, I don't know when you're, will, you, will this be out by this weekend? Next week. Oh, next, next week. Okay. Next Wednesday. We're going to have some early copies for, I'm going, I'm keynoting the Hackaday conference in Pasadena this weekend. And they'll gotcha. have some early copies there. Gotcha, gotcha. There you go. Well, check the show notes for details to that. Pluralistic.net, craphound.com. Anything else? Is that the place? Those are the places. Those are the places. Yeah. You know, Pluralistic is uh, like this multi-platform publishing venture I have. So everything that I publish on Pluralistic is simultaneously published to a mailman list with no uh, telemetry, no no ads and no HTML. It's just just text files. Uh, it's also full text RSS. And it's a, um, a medium feed, a Mastodon feed, a Twitter feed. And uh, it's also available through discourse. So you can you can get it wherever you wherever you like to get your media, you can get it. Awesome. Very cool. Thank you, Corey. All right. I'll talk to you guys later. Well, Corey has the lost cause, his science fiction novel out soon. I think it begins going on sale sometime this month here in November. And then, of course, the Internet Con, how to seize the means of computation. That's out right now. And it's also available as a DRM-free audiobook read by Corey himself. It's on my list. I'm queuing it up. So Jared and I just got back from KubeCon, Cloud Native Con, the longest name of any conference I've ever been to. And let me just say, it was an absolute circus in the expo hall. So many vendors, so many demos, so many badge scans so many socks jared must have picked up 15 pairs of socks i resisted almost all swag this time i I just couldn't i couldn't do it i just couldn't do it but it was so fun seeing the the cloud native world and what's happening there we're excited to get something back online i won't say too much but we're working on something and we'll see we'll see and also we met gerhard himself face to face A, a true handshake not a zoom or Riverside session that we record in for these podcasts, a literal Gerhard in the flesh. 
hey what's up high five hug all that good stuff it was cool and uh glad to officially meet after all these years of course a big thank you to our friends at fastly fly and typesense and of course to the beat freak in residence break messes cylinder Woo, such good beats good good beats okay we'll see you on monday that's it bye friends